this video tutorial, I'm going to be discussing how you can potentially use an Arima model or the autoregressive integrated moving average model to potentially forecast future prices based on existing data and how the model can ultimately serve as a useful addition to technical analysis trading. So in this particular example, I'm going to be using an illustration of two different stocks. And let's assume they both return 15% annually, but one has a volatility of 25% and another has a volatility of 7%. So when we look at the first stock on the graph here, we can see that while we have an overall uptrend, we still see quite a zigzag pattern and there's quite a bit of volatility. So a trader who's holding this stock and expecting it to appreciate over time is going to see a lot of their returns eroded by volatility because the gains on the stock don't have as much ability to compound over time. On the other hand, let's take a look at this stock. Again, it's 15% return, but a much lower volatility of 7%. So purely from a technical standpoint, a trader would prefer to hold this stock because not only are his returns compounding over time, but it's easier to forecast that this stock will likely continue to go up. There's low volatility, so it means that buyers are in control of price and the trend has a clear path to the upside. So you're probably wondering, well, what does any of this have to do with Arima? Well, an Arima model is designed to forecast a future movement, but a lower volatility forecast is going to be more accurate since our trend is more clearly defined. We could have a situation where price is going up overall, but if we see that the price is zigzagging quite a bit, this is going to lower the credibility of our forecast and our distribution will be wider, as you're going to see in a minute. So when we're analyzing a model with a view to forecasting by Arima, one of the main things we're looking at is the autocorrelation function of the data, which is simply looking at the degree of correlation between a value and the one immediately previous to it. For the first stock, we can see that our lags for the autocorrelation functions show a more or less linear trend but only dip off slowly, while the partial autocorrelation function drops immediately after lag 1. Similarly, when we look at the data for stock 2, we can see the same thing happening. The autocorrelation function dips off slowly, but the, car the partial autocorrelation function drops right away. So based on that, we can strongly suspect that our model is non-stationary. In other words, our mean, variance, and autocorrelation are not constant over time. And this could lead to forecasting difficulties with our model. I'm assuming that you're already familiar with the concept of stationarity. If you're not, I recommend that you go back to review the stationarity and co-integration section on this website. Otherwise, the terms that I'm discussing might seem a bit confusing. But in any case, just to give a brief overview, we can see that we have a non-stationary series for the first stock which shows a clear trend and it's only when we first difference the series that our residuals follow a random walk. Similarly for the second stock our residuals are not random so we have to first difference the series to make them random. However the only way we're going to know for sure if our model is non-stationary is to conduct a Dickey-Fuller test. So in this example we can see that our Dickey Fuller test is not significant at the 5% level with a p-value of 0.5899. This means that our data is non-stationary and this has important implications when it comes to specifying the Arima model. Now the Arima model itself consists, consists essentially of two parts, the autoregressive term, the differencing term, and the moving average term. Given we saw that our partial ACF dropped after lag 1, our Arima model will accordingly have an AR1 term. Additionally, to account for the first differences in our model, we will assign our differencing term a value of 1 and our moving average term a value of 0. So our Arima model is specified as 110. Now when we run the Arima model, we can see that we have a predictor along with a confidence interval around that predictor. And specifically, the one thing that jumps out at us immediately is that we have a much wider distribution around the Arima model for the first stock than for the second. We can see that the range of the distribution is indicating to us that the price could pretty much go anywhere, whereas for the second stock, the distribution is bounded at the higher levels. In other words, the Arima model isn't necessarily telling us whether the price is going to go up or down. Rather, it's giving us a range as to where price could be expected to go based on previous movements. So for the second stock, while the price could go down, we can reasonably expect that it'll stay more or less near the highs achieved over the past 500 days. So a trader would be looking at this and saying, well, based on what's happened in the past, there's very little risk of the price dropping dramatically, for the, whereas for the first one, this is a big possibility. It could pretty much go anywhere. And not forgetting, of course, that the price isn't bounded at current levels, and it could still have plenty of upside in the second case. Now, to supplement the Arima model, we are also going to test the residuals of our Arima model using the long box test. 
Essentially, we wish to further test our data to see if it follows a random walk or exhibits serial correlation. And in both cases, when we run the test, we have a p-value of roughly 0.23. So we cannot reject the null hypothesis, and the evidence is suggesting that our data is following a random walk. So these are our summary statistics for the first model, and again for the second. In terms of our second model, we can see that we have overall lower volatility as measured by sigma squared, and on the whole, our mean error statistics are also lower, meaning that any forecasts made with the second model are more likely to be accurate with the first. So in terms of comparing these two models, it's clear that on the basis of technical analysis, going along the second stock would be more favorable because the Arima model has given us a more accurate forecast, and we can be much more confident that the price trend will push higher over time. Since our distribution is much wider for the first stock, the price could still fall quite dramatically and a technical analysis would avoid such a trade because the upward trend is not strong enough to warrant going long. So that's how an Arima model can ultimately supplement technical analysis and provide further insight as to the strength of a trend. Obviously no forecast is accurate and Arima doesn't particularly forecast directions but rather confidence intervals as to where price can expect to be bounded over time. But this has a great deal of use because it can provide clarification as to whether a trader's perceptions of trend is accurate. So that's all for this video. Many thanks for watching and I hope you gained a useful insight into Arima and how it could potentially be used for technical analysis. See you next time. Bye.